hello and welcome to this evening's session on pastoral care, chaplaincy and counselling at MST in Easton. My name is Daisy and I'm the Dean of Students here at the College. Tonight we'll be hearing from Dr Michael Brodigan, who is the Director for the Centre for Theology and Psychology and lecturer at MST and Easton in Theology, uh, History and Psychology. Michael not only has a background and studies um, both in theology and psychology, but also in practical ministry, and he's passionate about seeking to combine the pastoral vision and that academic excellence. We'll also hear from Dr. Angelo Chetelin, the Dean of Faculty at Easton. Angelo also lectures in Christian Foundations, pastoral care and field education units. Angelo has a background in law and as well as all of this has 30 years of pastoral ministry experience. So he'll be sharing with us tonight in a conversation about chaplaincy, pastoral care and counselling at MST and Easton. They will be sharing with us for about 30 minutes and following that will be a time for questions. So if you do have any questions, please put them in the little Q&A box on your screen. We'll be using the Q&A box and not the chat. Please also note that this session is being recorded. So if you know of someone who may want to watch it or you can't stay for the whole thing, the recordings will be available to those who have registered for Open Day um, in about a week's time. So it's now my pleasure to hand over to Michael. Hi and good evening, everyone. I almost said good to see you. I can't really see, see you here. I, uh, know that you're joining us and that's great and um, it's good to, good to be with you and I'd like to share a few things about our new center here at MST Eastern which is called the Center for Theology and Psychology as Daisy said and um, it's a fairly new initiative. Uh, we just turned one year this week uh, so we went online last year uh, right in lockdown as well and our tagline here is transformation through integration. And this is what we really believe that by integrating theology and psychology, we would really um, be transformed and flourish as followers of Jesus Christ. Now, what do we do? What's, what is uh, CTP? So I'm gonna share a little bit here with you. And uh, if you have any questions, yeah, feel free to post them uh, in the chat on the Q&A. Uh, we equip Christian leaders who participate in Jesus Christ's action in this world with transformative skills and tools to grow and nurture healthy communities, in particular with a view to well-being. And you can, I hope, see and read here in this uh, mission statement that it's more than just teaching. So it's more than a delivery of content. It's really about growing in our skill sets and in how we can serve others who struggle in their mental well-being. Now, our team consists of um, psychologists, Christian counselors, we have uh, psychiatrists on board, uh, theologians, pastors, social workers, and they all share that same vision really of training professionals really in their own fields. So if, um, you are, for instance, well, well, a little bit more about purpose here. So we want to equip and strengthen the Christian church in Australia by integrating these two topics, theology and psychology. And then it's really about Christian leaders. I say a little bit more in a few minutes, who do we have in mind, uh, who, who we really are serving here with this new center as we seek to support the mental well-being of believers. And also, I mean, another goal that we have is to improve the mental health literacy and reduce stigma within the church. I mean, you still get that today, that in the church, yes, it's okay if you have a physical problem, but with a psychological problem, you might run into difficulties still, unfortunately, today in 2021. And that should not be the case. So especially with, you know, the whole uh, lockdown problems, you might have heard that um, and seen witnessed that um, mental health problems are increasing, unfortunately. And so there, there should be a growing awareness about the problem. And so we want to help with that and really educate and equip in that space. So as I promised, a few words about our 
key audience and our friends. So we really would like to serve pastors and youth workers and youth ministers, uh, also chaplains in uh, Christian schools and well-being coordinators and teachers. And then, of course, also cross-cultural workers, missionaries, uh, and also counselors, psychologists, and psychiatrists. So it's really about a training, the trainer concept. So we train those who serve in these really important areas. Now, we have four um, pillars or areas or wings, whatever you might call it. Uh, we offer training, which is uh, not accredited, but obviously very helpful, and uh, otherwise we wouldn't do it. And uh, I'm going to say a little bit more about each of those uh, in a minute. Then we offer teaching opportunities, and that's probably why you're here to hear more about that, so I will focus on that. But also research, maybe you're here because you think about uh, postgrad studies, maybe you think about a master's or maybe even a PhD. And that's also something that we would offer at this integrative um, uh, option here, theology, psychology, integration. And we have a few resources available as well. Now, let's look at training. So training, again, not accredited. We have had quite a few webinars and workshops already this year. And if you want to uh, watch what we've done so far, you'll find a lot on our resource website. Um, what's coming up is, a, I hope, person uh, in person, face to face, a Christian mindfulness workshop with uh, Dr. Catherine Thompson in November. And next month, we have a youth mental health webinar series in collaboration with um, other organizations. That's around World Mental Health Day, which is, I think, on the 10th of October. And you find out, you can find out more on our website, and it's uh, pretty easy to find. And this is the one. So we offer a youth mental health toolkit, a webinar series for practitioners to improve mental health and well-being for young people. You probably read in the newspapers that um, there is really a crisis in uh, youth mental health, and we thought we need to do something about it. And yeah, you find out more here about this uh, free webinar, or actually it's several free webinars on our website. So that's something we offer that's for free and that's uh, not accredited, but obviously worthwhile. Another option that we offer is the Thriving Christian Leader Program. And here you're invited to really effectively integrate faith and work in your own context. Um, we are currently running this pr uh, program. We had four of these workshops so far. The fifth one is coming in October, but that's closed, obviously. It's a, it runs every year, and you can, if, if you want to join, you can register your interest for the 2022 cohort. And uh, it's really about transformational learning. So it's small groups uh, and they meet in between these workshops where you talked about the content that's been delivered and you try to grow together. Again, you find out more on our website. Some of the topics are um, identity and calling, figuring out who we are, what our calling, what our vocation is, growing in resilience and self-care, um, skills and support. How can I support others? Uh, reading our context well and the culture, so important these days. And also, how do I communicate effectively and how um, do I serve in the community? So, yeah, just if you're interested, have a look at our website. You'll find much more information than I can share with you in these few minutes here. Now, teaching is our next uh, big area, and here you might be interested to hear more about the graduate certificate of pastoral care for mental health that's a new uh, degree that's we're, we're just running the second unit this semester last semester we had uh, the unit called theological perspectives on mental health and this semester now we're running theological approaches to well-being and it's really encouraging to see uh, how we have pastors and chaplains and counselors all in the classroom Unfortunately, not this semester, it's all online, but 
last semester, we, we were actually able to do it on site. And that was beautiful to watch how we would, uh, could encourage one another and learn from one another. And uh, yeah, hopefully again, face-to-face -face next semester, but the online option is always there as well. Again, if you want to find out more, let's have a chat. You can always email me and we can talk about that in more detail uh, in the weeks to come if you want to find out more. Um, some of the topics that I included in these two units are, for instance, positive psychology and theology is such an exciting intersection here. Uh, you might have heard of uh, Seligman and the, the whole movement of positive psychology. There's such a great overlap between what is happening in psychology and what we can uh, say as theologians speaking into that and where we can learn from one another and um, grow spiritual resilience and vitality, post-traumatic flourishing, <laughs> something we probably all need in, in lockdown, having the hope that through all these experiences there can be some growth and even some flourishing. Also here, suffering and well-being, how, how do the two connect both from a psychological and theological viewpoint? culture and mental health, mental health and church history, fascinating topic. And yeah, some of our experts here, Catherine Thompson, Judy Wilkie, Matt Jacobi, Tom Kimber, maybe you've met some of them already or know some of them. And they're often coming from this dual background of having a, a pastoral, psychological and theological background maybe even. We also do research. We have um, our first research project here, which is um, really designed to, well, making sure that, that when we assess those who want to go into the mission field, that, that we do that well and that we really think how can we do that better how can we the whole screening process of future cross-cultural workers how can we improve this process and that's a fairly um, extensive research project headed up by dr Catherine thompson and um, that's really beneficial to mission organizations obviously and everyone who wants to go into mission to have a proper follow-up and all that, that, that's an important project. We also, we are also working here on the second one, your attitudes towards mental health in the Australian Evangelical Church. Yeah, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's still a bit of stigma around, and this research project seeks to reduce this stigma and really raise awareness for mental health issues in the church. And then of course, we also uh, offer postgraduate supervision, so PhD, program, master thesis, doctor of ministry. And as I said before, we offer resources on our webpage. So if you wanna get a feel for, for one of our webinars, what, what is this like or what, what have we done so far in uh, our workshops, feel free to, to join. Some of those are there available on the website. And um, yeah, we also have a directory of mental health providers for referrals if you're interested, if you, that, that could be, and that is actually quite important if, if you seek confidential information in terms of, okay, who's a uh, Christian psychiatrist, psychologist, counselor, who, who, is, uh, who do you recommend? Then we have a list for you available. We, we don't make it public, um, but if you email us, then we will give you that information. So. Yeah, this is another way in which we try to serve the community, Christian community here in Melbourne and uh, Australia. Now, if you have any questions, please email either me, that's my email address here, mbrautigam at mst.edu.au, or you can email our assistant here, um, Judy Lillis, and we'd be uh, really happy to chat and have a conversation and about any of these topics, whether it's teaching, any, any um, teaching obviously that we have or training um, or supervision, whatever it may be, please do get in touch and uh, let us know and um, we can talk some more uh, later on this evening. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, it's now my great pleasure to hand over to Dr. Angelo Chatelain is talking more about chaplaincy. 
Well, thanks, Michael. Um, that was very informative and uh, and encouraging too as to what we do offer here at MST, and particularly the exciting Centre for Theology and um, Psychology. I'm the Dean of Faculty at Eastern College, and Eastern and MST uh, work together as one community, um, and we've got some very interesting programs as well. I suppose one of the things that uh, I'd like to discuss, uh, working with pastors for many, many years now, I'm still a pastor as well, um, as well as working at college as the Dean of Faculty. Um, my wife and I are still uh, are involved heavily in pastoring a church in the inner city of Melbourne, so we still have that hands-on experience. Um, but one of the questions that people often ask is, what's, what's the difference um, between pastoral care and chaplaincy and counselling? How does all that work? They seem to be very different kind of areas. So hopefully I'll have a bit of a, a discussion, a bit of a chat around that. And if you've got some questions, of course, you can put it in the, in the Q&A um, uh, chat function there and uh, we'll have some uh, time later on to have a, a bit of a discussion around that and Daisy's going to come and moderate us in that so first of all I just want to just share that pastoral care is is more of a general term for um, ministry or service um, where a pastoral carer could provide uh, support services in areas of basic health or spiritual health uh, could be in counseling or even education uh, could involve visitation to hospitals or prisons, could even involve palliative care or bereavement care. And uh, there's, there's a broad range of what pastoral care can involve prayer support or conducting memorial ser services. Uh, so there can be an emotional component to that, a, a social component and a spiritual um, support component. Interesting enough that the term pastoral care is increasingly being used in non-religious forms of support. It's kind of like the term's been adopted um, by a, it's like a, the contemporary term that seem a little bit distinct from the traditional pastoral ministry side of things. And one of the things that Easton does is that we train people up to have a Christian worldview and perspective and but go into the professions, whether it's teaching or counselling or community development, but to do that from a, a Christian worldview and perspective, uh, which gives them, I think, an, an added um, uh, a bonus, a boost really to see the world as God sees and be able to bring God's love and care into their particular professions and, and areas where they're working. So it, it's pastoral care is often adopted by uh, people from non-religious groups because it sounds less religious than something like chaplaincy. Um, but essentially it's about relating uh, gently and skillfully um, with people's inner worlds. And it involves people's inner sense of self, their, their inner resources that they, that they have or they need and they can develop. Um, it's about developing resilience, the capacity to cope, and it's about their relationship with God. And there's such a need in our community right now, particularly during this uh, particular COVID-19 pandemic time, there's such a need for people to be involved on the, on the front lines in areas of pastoral care in so many different ways. Now, pastoral ministry is something that's more specific to uh, various faith and of course it comes from the concept comes from the Christian faith and uh, so it involves more for us as, as Christians or those that, are, that have a Christian uh, tradition more that supernatural empowerment are more subjective than uh, merely a um, a non-religious or scientific based care it involves that but goes beyond that so for Christians uh, pastoral ministry relates to the, the shepherd's role. That's the metaphor that's used, the shepherd's role of caring for their flock. And uh, interesting enough, other faiths are now adopted that metaphor, and even non-religious groups um, talk about pastoral ministry uh, in areas that emphasise care and, and social responsibility. Now, the Bible itself, uh, as regards to the role of a pastor, it doesn't really define it specifically, but it is associated with, with teaching, and it involves shepherding the flock. So um, it, it revolves around things like protection of people, encouragement, uh, spiritually feeding people, refreshing them, uh, leading by example to pursue a relationship with God, pursue holiness. It involves uh, comforting and guiding people. And it can involve the care of people's souls. And of course, it, it involves things like sermons as well and administering the sacraments. Now, chaplaincy, 
Um, so we've looked at pastoral care, pastoral ministry, and our chaplaincy. This is usually referred to help that's given by ordained or sometimes trained, um, either paid or trained volunteers. And that's usually associated with a designated religious group or denomination that provides this pastoral care. So chaplains usually represent a specific faith or tradition and they deliver their pastoral services on behalf of that particular religious group or denomination. They're trained in a specific area of ministry like visitation in, in prisons or hospitals. Now, the difference between a, a pastor uh, um, and a chaplain is usually that they serve in different locations. So a pastor or an ordained minister or clergy person usually works in a church or a parish, whereas a chaplain is um, usually ordained um, as a minister or a cleric, but uh, specialising in uh, ministry of a religious tradition attached to a um, particular organisation or institution, uh, for example, a hospital or a prison or a, uh, even a military um, uh, establishment or a school or a union, a business place, a police uh, sports group. Um, even the Melbourne Football Club has a chaplain, believe it or not, so a chaplain to the demons, if any, anyone follows VF, um, AFL football. Um, so they perform religious rites, they conduct worship services, um, they can provide confidential counselling, spiritual guidance, providing comfort, encouragement, and even those in the military provide spiritual advice uh, to the commanders on um, religious issues, moral matters, and uh, particularly in this day and age now where the issue of moral injury has become um, a, a, an important part of the discussion around our military. Uh, they can actually be commissioned officers stationed with the military as well. So uh, both pastors uh, and chaplains are theologically trained and certified ministers, but they have different job descriptions. I suppose one way of putting it is that all chaplains are pastors in some sense, but not all pastors are chaplains. Chaplains are specifically trained for a particular um, institution or organisation other than the local church parish. Then there's that other phrase or terminology called counselling uh, and more generally it's, it's I suppose you could um, refer it as a unique form of therapy or talk therapy some people call it. So it's, it's um, and, and Christian based counselling uses both spiritual resources as well as psychological insights for healing and personal growth. It's, it's provided by certified and qualified counsellors and uh, Christians one, Christian ones have that in-depth theological training as well. So as um, Michael's been talking about, we've got unaccredited training and we've got right up to accredited training. And it's, um, it's, it's, uh, where Christians are involved in that depth of pastoral care and are trained for it with, with particular qualifications, they can be trained in the mental health area where professionals provide both psychological therapy and spiritual guidance to individuals or couples, or families and groups in various settings. Now, due to that uh, specialised counselling work, pastoral counsellors have to be highly trained both in psychology and theology. So, uh, how do you discern which way to go, whether you're, you're going to be involved in an element of pastoral care in your local church or with a particular group as a volunteer or whether you're uh, meant to be a chaplain or a counsellor or, or whether counselling, a qualification can help you in, in your pastoral ministry. There are many different ways that you can uh, find discernment and, and that's by, well, doing like you're doing now. And I'm so gratified to see how many participants we've got in this particular session tonight. Um, getting information is so important. So you can pray prayerfully with the information at, at, at your fingertips. Um, you can talk to a pastor, a counsellor, a mentor, um, talk to various people that are associated with the Centre for um, Theology and Psychology, um, different leaders that might be able to help you collate information, pray with you and encourage you as to the step that God wants you to take. Now, people can be equipped from, uh, I suppose you'd call it the base level of a, a certificate four, and Eastern does provide a certificate four in chaplaincy and pastoral care. And this is where you're trained in the area of competency. I suppose the best way to describe it is you're trained in how to do various functions. Um, so how to respond to client needs, how to provide loss and, and grief, um, 
how to use communication and build relationships, how to work with diverse people, how to work legally and ethically, how to, how to work with people with mental health issues, um, how to plan and to provide pastoral and spiritual care and, um, and how to reflect on your own professional practice. These are the competencies that are, that are taught. These are specific units or modules that you can do in the Certificate 4 of Chaplaincy and Pastoral Care. And we usually run that through intensives at the Juan Turner campus, but we also have online uh, provision of those particular units. So we have a mixture um, so that meets different peoples in different localities. Not everyone's able to come into Melbourne, obviously. So we do have online courses as well. There are lots of different electives as well. Um, within that particular certificate for in chaplaincy and pastoral care. So it's basically that AQF, what's called AQF, Australian Qualifications Framework, level four, and it has that practical uh, requirement. Where it's distinct from higher education, it's where higher education, and we do have a Bachelor of Applied Social Science majoring in counselling at Eastern, and we also have a Master of Community counselling at Eastern and so in higher education there's a greater emphasis on the theoretic, theoretical knowledge and where the practical is emphasised in particular units where you go and do counselling field work. One of the units that I, I teach is in, um, at, at MST actually is in uh, pastoral field work and so there is opportunities not only to learn the theoretical but actually to, to find placements and we help students find placements to work at schools, whether a Christian school or a non-Christian school as a counsellor, or to um, work, um, work towards getting training to become counsellors in their own rights, where they set up their own, own business. So the important thing to realise about the qualifications that we have at Eastern is that they're accredited with the Australian Counselling Association, which is the largest professional body in Australia. So we have the same accreditation as most universities and major universities and um, the, the Australian Counseling Association really warmed to our graduates. Many of our graduates have become chaplains, counsellors in both Christians, as I said, and, and public schools, in community agencies, um, the counselling graduates we have become uh, counsellors, clinicians, life coaches, peer support workers, mentors, pastoral carers and community development workers within our community within church and within government agencies and, and in private practice as well. I was just talking today, interestingly enough, with a number of people that will be graduating at the end of this year in a class that we have called the Integration of Faith and Vocation. A number of those people will be taking up positions in schools as a counsellor. And that came out of a need that they found when they were going through school that they didn't have a counsellor that they could go to. Others of uh, those graduates are going to be setting up their own counselling practice. So there's lots of different ways um, of outworking that particular interest in providing pastoral care, uh, whether it's formally through a denomination, whether it's working for a church in a support role, um, or whether it's in a private practice. So there's a lot of interesting um, uh, uh, modules and units that are in um, our particular suite of um, awards and degrees that we provide. All of them have that uh, very strong uh, Christian ethos and foundation and worldview. Um, and then they build on that uh, and they provide the exact same qualifications uh, recognised by the government, recognised by secular and Christian organisations. And so we're very excited to be able to provide that and um, to see it expand and grow. And with the, the new centre for the integration of theology and psychology, it just expands the capacity that we have to provide these services and to see people who are confident in their identity as Christians and being able to be well qualified professionals in various areas. So I think I've probably chatted enough around this area of, of the difference between chaplaincy, pastoral care and counselling and the different areas that we provide. And maybe uh, I will now hand back to Daisy and she will take us from here. Thanks, Daisy. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, um, Angela and Michael, for sharing us with us not only the uh, course options available um, at both MST and Eastern, but also uh, in talking about 
what is the difference between, between these things? How do we discern where the Lord may be leading us? So we do have a lot of questions coming in. And if you do have more questions, please uh, feel free to put them in uh, the Q&A box on the screen. We've got some topical questions and some practical questions about studying with us. So we'll start with some of the more topical questions. Uh, one to start with um, for you, Michael, is how can we talk to people about the integration of theology and psychology, which this center is all about when so many people always talk about them as really separate things mm. oh that's a really good question thanks daisy yeah and historically unfortunately that's that's been the case that these two disciplines have kind of developed independently more and more of each other and uh, that that should not be because there is so much value in uh, the the opportunity of cross-pollinization of these two um, that there's, there's a lot we can learn about a human being from psychologists, you know, when you think about the com complexity of our own being, you know, at the psychosomatic union, uh, maybe you've heard of that, how, how we, uh, how a whole being works. That, I think that's something we should know as um, yeah, theologians, as, as pastors, really. So, uh, and, and vice versa for psychologists who seek to help people, who really want to help people. Um, it, it's so important to know at least the basics of theology. I mean, that's how, I mean, just as a personal note, I wanted to become a Christian counselor when I started my studies and um, I was finished with psychology and I thought, hmm, that's, that's not really enough. I need to know more about God and, and the Bible in order to really be able to help people. So yeah, that's so important. There's so much uh, promise in that. Yeah, definitely. It's really encouraging how, um, as well, just towards the end, you mentioned the way that our faith in theology impacts things, it not only impacts psychology, but it impacts counselling, it impacts teaching, it impacts business, everything that we do. Um, God is behind it and he's working through us. That's really cool. A question uh, for you, Angelo, is at Easton, um, does counselling students only learn Christian counselling? It's a, that is a really good question, and it's kind of related to the previous one, isn't it, that um, um, we don't see things separately because all truth is, is God's truth, and actually having a theological training and mindset can give you an ability to discern different therapies and to discern um, how they stack up against the word of God and can actually help you in, 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 um, in being a good counsellor or being a good therapist. Um, so... Uh, our counsellors are, are fully, um, those that, that, that are trained with the Bachelor of Applied Social Science or Master of Community Counselling, they are able to function in a non-Christian setting as well as a Christian setting because the qualification is recognised across the board as a university equivalent higher degree, recognised by the government, recognised by Australian Counselling Association. Mm. But our students get that extra dimension, I suppose, if you like, of having that Christian foundation. So they're able to discuss the various different theories and they're able to assess them and evaluate them from a Christian worldview perspective as well. So our students are stretched and um, uh, I think they, they have everything that you would get at, at a secular counselling course but with more. Yes, definitely. And um, to those that may be considering counselling, I echo Angelo's encouragement uh, about the courses, uh, you being able to register as a counsellor upon graduation. I believe you can actually register as a student with the Australian Counselling Association when you're studying with us at Easton. And once you graduate, you get to move to a full registered status. So um, it's definitely a great place to start in the counselling courses. So move into a couple of questions about chaplaincy now. Um, and one question is, uh, we've talked about chaplains in schools a little bit, and Angelo, you mentioned chaplaincy in other areas as well. But are our courses specifically for chaplaincy in schools or do they kind of help people be prepared for work in other areas? I might speak into this a little bit and then um, hand over to you, Angelo. But um, 
our the certificate for in chaplaincy and pastoral care at Eastern does um, it's a nationally accredited chaplaincy course, so it definitely um, allows you to become a chaplain in a school and definitely lots of other areas. Though this is an area where different industries, even different organisations, might have different requirements that they're wanting for their chaplains. So it's good to do a little bit of industry research as well. Um, for example, if you're wanting to do specific chaplaincy in a hospital, um, sometimes they might require you to do a course called CPE, which is called Clinical Pastoral Education. And that isn't offered at MST or Eastern, but you can do it um, as a cross-institutional uh, unit with another college um, and have it count towards your course at MST. So we've had graduates at both MST and Eastern go on to be chaplains in schools, um, sporting clubs, like Angelo mentioned. We had someone who was being a chaplain in a factory um, as well, aged care facilities. There's lots of different places uh, where people can be chaplains today. Um, it's a little bit confusing as well. We do have lots of options at MST and at Eastern um, when it comes to chaplaincy. So we would encourage you to um, give us a call or shoot through an email, make a time to chat with someone from our student services team. We can have a chat with you about your specific um, hopes for study outcomes and what courses might be um, best for you, definitely. Another um, pastoral care type question. Um, and this is to do with auditing some units. Um, so if someone is involved in ministry in their church and they're looking at um, auditing some pastoral type units. Um, shout out to both of you, whoever would like to answer this one. What would you recommend for someone wanting to just do some audit type study in pastoral care? Oh, you go, Michael, first. I mean, yeah, I, I'm, I'm obviously biased, <laughs> but... Um, uh, we, we have quite a few audit students actually in our, it's almost half half uh, this semester in our uh, course, Theological Approaches to Wellbeing. And that works really well. So if you're, you're not able to commit to a full study, accredited study, I mean, that's a great uh, idea to get a taster of what this is like. And you can, yeah, I, I really enjoy, I mean, this is the first time I'm teaching this unit, uh, Theological Approaches to Wellbeing, and also the other one, Theological Perspectives on Mental Health. It's, it really gives you a good insight as a pastor, really into uh, key aspects of self-care. How do we do self-care? How do we support others who are struggling? Um, yeah, really, really good stuff. And, and if you do an audit, that's a, that's a good way to start and you can always think about later maybe moving into full study yeah what do you think Angelo yeah absolutely uh, um, I think uh, perhaps one of the the first year type courses like introduction to counseling would be a great place to start and uh, you can get to meet people you can get a, a bit of a, a, a feel of what it's like um, to study uh, I know people that perhaps haven't studied for a while and may have a little bit of uncertainty about uh, doing a, an accredited course so they often start with uh, auditing a unit and uh, they they find after a while yeah I can do this and they can with the support um, you know it's it's amazing to see how many people do really really well even though they haven't studied for a while so yeah I would encourage perhaps one of the first year units we'll, we can chat to you about that and uh, we have a number of audit students so you, you're not on your own um, and I think it's a great way to get to put your feet in the water. Awesome. We did have another question about auditing. Is there any prerequisites to do auditing study? And no, there is not. You can go ahead and apply to um, audit any units with us. That's fine. Another practical question, um, while it's there, someone has asked, do we recognise prior learning? Yes, we also, if you have um, previous studies uh, in a similar area, um, of course, we would um, assess in your recognition of prior learning. Um, or if you're looking at doing this Cert 4 in chaplaincy and pastoral care, you're currently working as a chaplain um, and you've got some workplace experience that's relevant in the last couple of years, um, we can definitely assess that for recognition of prior learning learning as well. So this is really great questions. One to throw back to you, Angelo, on chaplaincy is chaplaincy has historically had a Christian focus. Um, so how does studying at MST or Eastern kind of prepare people for working in a multi-faith, multicultural society? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. All our 
um, approaches at Eastern and MST is very much focused on having that, um, I suppose, a missional mindset where we're not simply training people to work in a church environment, but really seeing our role as believers, as Christians, as making a difference in the world by seeing that um, we're called to actually function as part of our context, as part of our community. And so a lot of our courses and units train people to think contextually, to think about the environment that they're in, to think about the, um, the kind of zeitgeist, if you like, or the particular um, worldviews that are out there and being able to assess those worldviews. It's amazing how much great insight the word of God brings, theology brings to the realities of the world and how you can function in a way that brings blessing and flourishing and help people, whatever background or whatever faith they have, to, um, to live in a better way. And uh, God has just so many wonderful insights for us as to how we can be a blessing to the world. It's part of our, our mandate, I think, as Christians to be a blessing to the world. And so our courses reflect that and equip people and train people um, for that environment. Awesome, thanks, Angelo. We've only got one other question at the moment. So this might be our last question. I might throw it to you, Michael. How can someone practically explore um, moving into pastoral care or chaplaincy? What kind of things, other than obviously talking to us about study options, what kind of practical things can they do to kind of explore that? Hmm. I mean, well, you can always, I mean, maybe the starting to drop by as an audit, that's a good start. But and and the good thing about this this whole uh, this whole enterprises and Angela, you mentioned that is um, that we're becoming really from this pastoral perspective. Angela, you serve as a pastor, and I, I do that as well, as a small co-pastor in a church, and that's where yeah yeah that's where we're coming from, and I think that that speaks for itself, and that's so important that you not only get the, the, the high quality teaching, but it comes, uh, it's filtered through the pastoral soul. And I think that that's really crucial. Um, yeah, I'm not, I don't think that was really the answer to the question, Daisy, but maybe you have some ideas here. I don't know. <laughs> no, I think that's really, um, really helpful. And one thing I often encourage people to do is talk with their pastors, talk with someone that they know that is a chaplain or has a background in counselling and get a bit of an idea. It's definitely always a great kind of practical place to start, something I would add as well. Yeah, and, and Daisy, can I just jump in there? Because yes. I think one of the things that we, uh, I think with one of the things we're really known for and loved for is the fact that uh, MSC Easton is a real, um, it's a wonderful, rich community. And so um, the lecturers, the teachers are approachable. There's, um, you, you make f uh, friends and colleagues for life. And yep. so there's, there's a, a lot of ways of being able to get supported and um, it, it just informal ways of getting information and help, having prayer partners, people that will pray with you and help you and encourage you. So I think there's, I think the main thing is to start. <laughs> And, you know, and with that starting, you'll find the, the blessing and the help of God and you'll find that people will come alongside you. And you don't have to feel locked in. There are so many ways that, you know, you can start off in one direction and the Lord can lead you a little bit um, broader than what you thought originally. So, yeah, just encourage people to start. Yes, for sure. It's definitely great. And I love... Um, what you said about the community. I know I found this when I was a student, we talked about it a little bit this morning in the info session that one thing people say they love about MST and Eastern is it's not a big university where you're sitting in a lecture hall of hundreds of people, but we've got these smaller class sizes. You get to know your classmates, you get to know your lecturer, they know where you're at. They're not, you're not just a name on a piece of paper or a number, but um, each lecture is really, um, cares and wants to see you grow and wants to see you step into what the Lord has for you so yes definitely great encouragement at the end there Angelo 
Well, that brings us to the end of our session uh, for this evening. So thank you again, Angela and Michael for sharing with us. Thank you everyone for joining us. This does conclude our open day online. It's been a great day. Um, if your question wasn't answered today or you'd like to make a time to chat over the phone with our student services team regarding study options, um, I'm gonna put some information in the chat. Um, so please see those email addresses uh, in there now. Let me just do that quickly. Please see that information in the chat. Um, we'd be delighted to have a chat with you about study options. Um, so please go ahead and do that. We're really glad you were able to join us today. And so we do hope to hear from you soon. God bless. <laughs>